loud bell or not. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Churches, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, for it says that to each one of these churches, <clears throat> and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, just like those twelve liars out in Salt Lake City call themselves apostles, and they are not. Now notice what he says here. He says, uh, Thou canst not bear them, which are evil. Thou hast tried them, and found, hast found them liars. This church is commended for intolerance, for being politically incorrect, and not tolerating things that are not right with the Lord. They're discriminating against uh, false believers here, and the Lord commends them for doing just that. Um, and so, uh, under that principle, every church ought to be politically incorrect. But churches are full of uh, members who are not saved, members who are obviously not saved by the way they live and things like that. And uh, or appear not to be saved anyway, and they get tolerated. There's no such thing anymore as what's called church discipline, which the Bible talks about and gives, I think, uh, 14 different sins to to sever membership with a person in the church. Uh, but a very rare is uh, rarely is that uh, done anymore. Uh, what this what this church did, what they did not do, they did not believe everything they heard. And uh, you can't either. Look at First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians 5. You should not believe everything you hear. You should test it all out. Uh, First Thessalonians 5, verse, verse 21. He says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. First uh, John 4, verse 1. Try the spirits where they are of God or not. For many false prophets are going out into the world. Look at Acts 17. The trouble is with Christians today, they're so brain dead they listen to all those kooks on Christian television and Christian radio and believe everything those characters have to say. Somebody, somebody called me uh, one day last week from somewhere else, not from this church, and had just heard a preacher on the radio talking about that. He said when, when Jesus realized who he was at his baptism, when the Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son. Uh, and he realized God was his father at 12 years old when he was in the temple. Mm. And so what do you think about it? I said, well, he's lying to you. That's why you don't know what he's talking about. He's, Jesus is God from eternity. You, yes, you mean tell me that for 30 years he didn't know who he was? Come on. Huh. Uh, you hear all that nonsense, and uh, people just believe it. Acts 17, verse 11, this church is commended for checking things out. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Uh, it was in Thessalonica that Paul said, prove all things. We just read that a minute ago. And apparently they weren't doing that. These are more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They didn't just believe somebody who was telling them something. They checked it out by the word of God. And uh, most of us have heard somebody say, well, the Bible says, and it doesn't say any such thing. And they've... Uh, taking something out of context, or they're taking something they've heard somewhere. Uh, you know, the Bible says, um, let's see if I can think of one of those things. Godliness is, cleanliness is next to godliness. Verse, please. <laughs> Same thing like that. Anything remote, remotely connected to that. So we need to check things out. We need to be sure we're being told the truth. Uh, it doesn't matter who said it, if some preacher, some commentary, or whatever, you need to check it out by the word of God and see if it really. There's cross references right here. I've got to scroll through the reference Bible. There's cross references. Sometimes you can go to the cross reference and scratch your head and say, What's the connection here? You know, what did he see uh, in uh, comparing this verse with that one? 
and so forth. So you've got to check things out. And, and the Word of God is the only truth on the planet. God's Word is truth, John 17, 17. So you check it out by the Bible if it goes by. That's how we know the charismatic movement is wrong. Okay? doesn't match up with this. Hey. And so this church gets commended, this church at Ephesus, first, first church period, that's what it represents, the time of the apostles, the first hundred years, and uh, that's why they're checking out those who say they're apostles. Apparently, uh, some people were running around saying they were apostles and uh, identifying with the apostles when they really were not. So uh, we need to learn to check things out just like they did. Um, so a refusal to accept false believers and receive backslidden Christians and all that, that was a mark of the early church. It's certainly not a mark of the way I see it in the church. Every church today has got all kind of nonsense in it. Uh, that's against the scriptures. Look at Romans 16. God commended them for that. Their narrow-mindedness. You know what people say about that kind of thinking today? They're ridiculed. Mm -hmm. He's got no tolerance. You're right. You got no, you're too, too narrow minded. I'm not as narrow minded as God is. He says there's only one way to get to heaven, for example. Well, people say there's thousands of ways. Uh, Romans 16, verse 17 I beseech you, brethren, mark them. Sounds like intolerance to me. Which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. And do what? Avoid them. Avoid them. Do it. That's why they have to be put out of the church so they can be avoided. And verse 18 goes on talking about what their problem is. They're idolaters. Uh, you just don't hear much about it. When's the last time anybody in here heard about some church church of somebody? It just doesn't happen. And yet if you visit some of those churches, you, you can spot people who ought to be churched. <laughs> it just doesn't go on. Why? Why not? What does Laodicea mean? Rights of the people. Rights of the people. That's why. We live in a lukewarm Christian society and uh, everybody has their rights. And so, in fact, it's to the point now, and this has happened, that if you church somebody, they like to go in and hire a lawyer and sue the church. Things like that are happening these days. Yes, sir. Looks sure. Like, looks like that would trickle down from the leadership of the church. Well, it does. The leadership's not leading. That's the problem. They're okay. allowing those things in the church. He said, uh, he said, those that say, you've tried those that say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. Paul had to defend his apostleship. He does that in Galatians um, to the people in, in Galatia and prove to them who, that he was who he said he was. Look back a couple pages at 2 John. 2 John, verse 9. Well, verse 8, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Implication, you can lose part of your rewards, maybe all of them, by not doing what God says. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. You got that? Be intolerant. Stand in the door and don't let them in. Don't invite the Mormons in. Don't invite the JWs in. You'd be violating scripture if you do. Neither bid them God speed. Don't say God bless you. Don't say have a nice day. Verse 11, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So you tell that woman when he turns to leave your house, uh, have a nice day, God bless you and all that, then you are partaking of what he's going to tell your neighbor next door. His evil deeds. So we are to be intolerant towards certain people on this planet. Who was it that Jesus was intolerant to all through the Gospels? The Pharisees, the, Pharisees. the religious Pharisees. Yes, sir. And those are um, those are generally the, the people that teach damnable heresy doctrines that will send people to hell. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Right. All so the doctrine of Christ. Uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. Um, says they make merchandise of people by denying the, the, the blood and so forth, denying the Lord that bought them, so they add works to salvation. Church of Christ, you can't fellowship with them. They believe in baptismal regeneration, things like that. Uh, all Protestant denominations, except some of the fringe churches in those denominations, which call themselves independent just like we do, uh, and some of those believe the King James Bible, 
But by and large, all the Protestant denominations baptize babies, infant baptism. And that's heresy. So we're not to fellowship with people like that. We're to be intolerant. Now, it doesn't, he's not saying be intolerant of your neighbor because your neighbor's lost. You understand the difference? He's talking about religious people that are leading people astray. And we're not to, we're not to associate with them and have anything to do with them. All right, verse 3, Revelation 2, verse 3. Still talking to the church at Ephesus. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Implication, they borne persecution, which they did. The first church got persecuted an awful lot. That's uh, what caused them to spread out, spread out uh, to start with was Acts chapter 8, the persecution that arose over Stephen. And uh, the disciples were scattered and so forth. And then you get to Acts 13, Paul is commissioned by the Lord to give Barnabas to go to the Gentiles and throughout the Roman Empire. So he says you've borne, you've, you've, had, you've had patience, you've tolerated, you've uh, had to carry persecution, you've patiently endured. Uh, he's committed them for that. For my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. You kept, you stayed by the stuff, you kept doing what you're supposed to do in spite of the persecution, and you did it for my name's sake, and so he's committing them uh, for that. Nevertheless, verse 4, I have someone against thee, because thou was left thy first love. Um, you're dealing with a separated church here. Uh, they didn't tolerate uh, uh, liars and so forth, verse 2. They didn't tolerate things that were not right. But they were starting to become ritualistic, formalistic, and uh, drifting away from God. That's a mark of apostasy, by the way, when churches become ritualistic. Uh, they become apostate, which is the deal with, with uh, Presbyterians, with Lutherans, uh, who else? Some, yeah. of those, uh, some of those denominations that it's all ritualistic, they, which they borrowed from Catholicism. The whole thing is ritual. And so he says, um, uh, he says, I have something against you. You've left your first love. Uh, Peter puts it this way. He says, remember, remember what I've taught you. And Jesus puts it this way. Remember, therefore, verse 5, from whence thou art fallen and repent. Now, you need to keep in mind he's addressing the church, a body, a group, not uh, individual believers, and they're, they're told as a church to repent of their indifference toward God. Uh, they've become ritualistic, it's become pharisaical in what they're doing. Uh, it's ABC 1, 2, 3, and the Lord says, you forgot me, you left your first love, you're leaving me out of all this, uh, these things here, you're doing good things, you're doing right things, but you forgot who you're supposed to be doing it uh, for. You've left your first love, and so he condemns them for that. And uh, he says it only in verse 5. He says, uh, do the first works or else, or else. Well, that's, that's a bad thing to hear somebody say. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The Lord kept his word on that. The 4th century Ephesus ceased to exist. Has not existed since then. It's just a pile of rocks and ruins over there now where it used to be. Um, and so the Lord kept his promise. He did the same thing in the Old Testament. He was chapter 5, verse 5. Gilgal and Bethel were the tabernacle set up and all that. And they forgot God and became ritualistic. And the Lord said, I'm going to destroy it. And uh, kept his word on that. He does the same thing in the New Testament. So it wasn't an idle threat to the Lord. There's no idle about it today. Uh, we get apostate gifts at this church on the shelf. Okay? And not use it anymore. He said, repent. Um, from which thou art fallen, remember from, from which thou art fallen, and repent and do the first work. Now again, it has nothing to do with an individual. Consequently, it has nothing to do with salvation. The phrase fallen from grace is only found one time in the Bible. It's in Galatians 5. And it's not, it's not talking about somebody who's saved losing their salvation. In context, it's talking about somebody who's not saved trying to work their way to heaven, adding law to grace. And he says they're fallen from grace. In other words, grace can't help them at all if they're trying to depend on their works to get them to heaven. That's why if somebody's not saved, if in their mind they got some kind of 
thinking that uh, I, I, I do this and that and so forth and that'll get me to heaven. They're not saved if they're thinking that way. And a lot of professing saved people do think that way. They think their good works make some kind of points with the Lord, which the only points it makes is it gets you rewards for doing it for His sake, but it won't get you to heaven. And so uh, He says, repent from, from where you have fallen. Uh, you haven't fallen from grace, but you've fallen from your first love. You've fallen from giving the Lord the what? Preeminence in all things, Colossians says. Chapter 1, verse 18. Giving Him the preeminence. And so um, we need to be careful that doesn't happen with us. It doesn't happen to this church. You're so involved in programs, you forget the programmer. You're so involved in blessings, you forget the blessor. We need to be careful about that kind of thing, not become just uh, robots in this thing of Christianity. Yes, sir? I saw a t-shirt one time that said something like this. If you could do anything to work your way to heaven, then God would have never died. Well, that's exactly right. And Galatians says that. If there was a law given that could have given righteousness, then Jesus died in vain. So, that takes care of both testaments, by the way. Under the law and out of the law. All right, verse, uh, let's see, verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, Nicolaitan is a transliteration of two, two Greek words, the kao, which is uh, uh, conquer, to conquer, to rule, something like that, and lay off the people. Uh, the common folks and all that. So, and we, we get the word laity from that word. So what this heresy is, is a priest class rising up to take uh, domineer over the congregation, okay? Exactly what happened in the fourth century when Rome finally, the Bishop of Rome finally got the preeminence over all, all bishops and so forth, and uh, Catholicism was born. So. He's, he's, he's uh, commending them for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, uh, for, for hating that uh, some people would, would put a division between the preachers and the laity, okay? And there is no division. We're all made out the same mold, we're all got saved the same way, and just different callings in our life, okay? Different functions we have within the body of Christ, and that's the only thing that, that uh, makes us different from one another. And so there's not supposed to be a priest class that conquers the people. That's the way Catholicism is, the priesthood. Uh, keep the people in a state of fear. How do they keep them in fear? This Nicolaitanism, how's it work? Well, it's through, their, it's through their ignorance, but the thing is, if they're going to be right with God, they got to go to the priest. The confessional, all that stuff, it's a system of fear. Boy, if I, if I don't get there at 4 o'clock Saturday evening, when they have it down there at St. Mary's Church, uh, if I died Saturday night, I'd go to hell. I better go get my symptoms off of what I've done wrong this week. The preacher becomes a mediator. He does. He becomes a mediator. He can forgive the sins, yes. And they claim that. And in fact, the Pope claims to be God on the earth, which is about as blasphemous as you could, you could get. Um, there's, uh, there's some history. Schofield has a note here. On verse 6, he says that there's no ancient authority for a sect of the Nicolaitans, and it's symbolic. However, there is ancient authority uh, in some of the church history books. You can, you can read about uh, the apostolic, what's called the post-apostolic fathers, that is after the apostles were all dead, like Irenaeus and Cyprian and so forth, that came up after those guys, and in their writings they talk about these Nicolaitans and so forth. So there is some historical evidence of it. Uh, and in fact, Irene said uh, that they were founded by uh, Nicholas, who is the proselyte deacon in Acts chapter 6, about verse 4 or 5, so we're in there, um, which may or may not be the case. Who knows? Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. There's not supposed to be a ruling class per se in uh, Christianity. And that's why you get these, uh, 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 let's see, these um, Protestant headquarters, like Southern Baptist Convention is headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, and Southern Baptist Church has to get permission for them to do anything. 
Uh, in fact, it was the convention that Brother George Chapani, uh, pastor of the church in Pensacola, still pastor of the same church. But they were occupying a building that had been a Southern Baptist church, and they were given permission to occupy the building. Well, when the convention headquarters found out what was going on, that this, you know, they let these nuts in here, these independents, use the church, then they foreclosed on it and forced Brother George to move his congregation out of that building. Uh, and that foreclosure didn't come from the local congregation that had been in that building, it came from the national, where the headquarters were. And all the denominations have a, a headquarters overseeing their churches. Why are we called independent? Because ain't nobody outside these walls telling us what to do. That's why we're independent. We don't answer to some hierarchy 500 miles away. Uh, we run the church according to the scriptures, or some preachers don't run it according to the scriptures, but either way, nobody outside is telling them how to run the church, okay? Yes? It's like these churches are franchised. Well, in a sense, in a sense. They're approved. Uh, in fact, uh, Southern Baptists don't do this as much, but Methodists do. Every two years, they'll move a preacher from where he's at to another church, another city. You can't get to know your congregation in two years. I mean, really know them, you know? How are you going to minister to them? But uh, they, they, uh, they do that to keep, keep the congregation, their, their reasoning is this, which is nonsense. Well, the congregation is going to get to where they like that preacher, and they're going to put him up on the pedestal, and he's going to think he's more important than the, than the denomination in the headquarters. Uh, so they shift them around all the time. They're not the only denomination that does it either. Let's see, where did I say? First Peter 5? Okay, look at this, verse 1. The elders, which are among you. Okay, that's the, that's the pastors. Uh, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He said, uh, he said I've been around a long time, guys. I, I saw the Lord in His glory. That's Matthew 17. I saw Him before He went back to heaven. I've seen more of this than, than some of you have. He's talking you know, 30, 40 years later after the resurrection and talking to these uh, these preachers and so forth that have come up since then. And he said, I exhort you as an elder, here's what God wants you to do, verse 2, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Feed the flock, taking the responsibility of the flock, not by constraint, not because you're forced to do so, but willingly, not a filthy lucre, not because you're paid to do so, but of a Ready mind, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Um, Hebrews 13, verse 17. Whose, talking about the elders, whose faith what? Follow. follow. Whose faith follow. Being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, capital S, Jesus, shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So the elders are warned there, you don't have to be lorded over. God's flock. Say, who would do that? I know some independent Baptist preachers who do that. They remember their congregation can't even go out and buy a new automobile without checking them, them first. Uh, my authority over you ends at the threshold of your house. Okay? Got no authority in your house at all. Got no authority over your family. Anything like that. My authority is a spiritual thing. Has to do with the church. Uh, so they're not the Lord and over God's heritage, and they're to do so, uh, lead the flock as a, with a ready mind because of, the, because of the Lord, because they want to do that for Him and for His glory. Look at, uh, let's see, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. That verse in Hebrews said, uh, for they watch for yourselves. That's what a preacher's supposed to be doing. Looking out for the spiritual welfare of his congregation. Uh, first, first, uh, Second Corinthians one, verse twenty-four. Not for that we, the preachers, have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith you stand. He says the preachers are not supposed to domineer the people, but they're supposed to be helpers of their faith and so forth. Look at chapter ten, Second Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians 10, verse, uh, verse 8. Verse 8. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority. Okay, he's speaking as a preacher there. 
which the Lord hath given us for edification, to build the people up. As you said, build up in the most holy faith. And not for your destruction. I should not be ashamed. Look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 10. He says, our job is to uh, build up your joy, build up your faith, edify you, and keep you on track for the Lord and so forth. Chapter, what did I say? 13, verse 10. Therefore, write these things being uh, absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness. And he's talking to a carnal church here and told them what they need to do to straighten out. And he said, basically, you don't want to have to come and say this in person. I'll be uh, adamant about it. Lest I should use, use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. I'm here to set things right and build you up the way you're supposed to go, not here to destroy you. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so when um, church starts putting emphasis on ritual and, and uh, program and format and organization, all that stuff, they're already headed to apostasy. Um, Cyprian, one of the early church writers, had that kind of attitude in his writings. He elevated the, the elders above the uh, congregation, uh, bishops and so forth, and um, said they ought to be in charge of the bishops are in charge of local churches. Well, he's taking one preacher and putting him in charge over other preachers in that philosophy in, in various churches. And that's how this idea of bishop, a bishop is just a pastor, okay? Any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. It's office of a pastor. But by the third century, there were bishops rising up, taking charge of other bishops. And therefore, you had one guy overseeing 10 or 12 other preachers in their own churches and things like that. That was the, the beginnings of Catholicism. And so by the time you get to the fourth century, you got one bishop in Rome who said, we're going to take authority over everybody. And he becomes the first, he becomes the chief bishop and eventually became known as the Pope. Yes, sir. What was that first example you gave? Were you saying one man over several churches? Several churches. But not over several pastors. Yes, yes. The first example you gave. Well, that's it. He, he one strong-willed preacher, okay? He rose up, took charge of several other preachers, which in effect was taking charge of their churches. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you said that was in the Bible. You're saying that was an old tradition back then. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Cyprian was uh, pushing. Uh, which, of course, is, is heresy. And that developed into a heresy called apostolic succession which is what the popes claim to be, uh, all, you know, trace themselves all the way back to Peter the Apostle. And if you see a Catholic church with two keys on it, that's, that's the symbol for Simon Peter has the keys. No, Revelation 1, Jesus has the keys. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. In a sense, it looks like they're trying to take charge of not only the Catholic church, but any other church in religion, because they'll incorporate that. Sure, they stuff when they go to a different country and they'll take that stuff in. Yeah, Catholicism incorporates all the religious, whatever's going on in that country, into Catholicism. That's how these holidays got started. Uh, these uh, pagan holidays got brought into, into Christianity. Yeah. Yes, sir. Does this, uh, SPC, does the uh, Baptist Convention even try to claim scripture for their convention for being a part of a group like that? Or is it just a matter of tradition? No, it's, uh, it's more of a matter of tradition. It's the same kind of thing uh, way back 1700s. The Southern Baptist Convention didn't rise in 1700, but it was beginning back there with Baptists that uh, certain strong preachers were looked up to for leadership, and eventually it became that they became the leaders, and everybody had to go to them to you know, to get direction, things like that. And, uh, Southern Baptists drew from, without realizing, probably drew from Catholicism as well with their deacon board. That's uh, That operates the same way as the board of bishops in Catholicism. So. All right. Uh, now, he says in verse 6, notice this. This thou hast of the hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitan, a ruling class, priest class, which I also hate. He commends the, the church for hating that kind of situation. And Jesus said he also hates it. He, uh, he didn't want anything like that going on uh, in the body of Christ, in his 
in his church. So the whole thing is contrary to scripture. It's against what God wants. And so the Lord himself hates it just like the church does. Uh, Matthew 23, if you read that, is a, is a, could we say, scathing sermon. Seven times that sermon, the Lord refers to those Pharisees, those religious leaders as hypocrites, and tells them basically they're dead, um, there's no life in them, and so forth. Just really uh, gets on their case. And that's the same thing here, ruling class. Um, back in, uh, in the days of the Pharisees, people referred to them as father, just like they do in Catholicism. They bowed before them, showed them reverence and so forth. But the Lord says basically all Christians are brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all, we're all the same thing. There's no, no uh, hierarchy in the Lord's situation except the spiritual thing that the pastors were responsible for, the church, and, and oversees the church and has the rule of the church. That's what it says uh, three times in Hebrews chapter 13. So uh, the Lord said in that sermon, he said, you're not supposed to call religiously the master, and you're not supposed to call him father. Uh, how many of y'all realize that, uh, for example, at every one of these uh, karate schools, it's based on religion? Mm -hmm. Y'all realize that? And they start off every time with the practice where bowing to the master. Every single time. Sexy. And of course, uh, Americans don't look at it as religion, but that's where all that tradition came from, out of Korea, Japan, all that. Uh, it came from them <coughs> bowing to their master and all that kind of stuff. So, religious stuff, even in what we would claim as secular things. In verse 9 of Matthew 23, it says, don't call any man on this earth father. Now, he's not talking about your paternal daddy, okay? That's all right. Uh, the Bible uses the word father for dads all through, all through the Bible. He's talking about religious leaders in context. So what do the Catholics do? They call the priest father. And uh, basically worship the guy because he's the one that can forgive their their sins. Verse 7. Revelation 2 verse 7. He that hath an ear. Say, well, I got two of them. Well, let's see what he means by that. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Uh, now, that everybody hath an ear in the sense the Lord is talking about in this passage. There's two groups of people that don't have an ear. Uh, there are people without spiritual ears. They cannot hear what God is saying. They cannot hear the still small voice. They cannot hear the scriptures. And we've had people like that come in church and lost people and things couldn't just to, you know, where you've witnessed to people like that, uh, they didn't have the foggiest idea what you were talking about. They had no connection at all. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 talks about people like that. It says, says the things of God are spiritually discerned and the carnal man receives not the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. So you got that category of people who don't have an ear to hear. And you got Christians who are dull of hearing. He spends a lot of time in Hebrews chapter 5 talking about them. And they're just not willing to hear what God has to say. And we have them even in our own churches, independent Baptist churches. They're going to do their thing regardless of what the Bible says. And the preacher can preach till he turns green, falls flat in the floor, and they're still going to do what they want to do. Never mind what that said. I don't I, Brother Wagner and I had a man tell us that one time sitting in the office. He said, I don't care. I know what the Bible says. I don't care. And he did what he wanted to do, and within a year, he ruined his life. Um, look at uh, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Don't get dull of hearing. Don't ever let the words of God become commonplace to you. Mark chapter 7. These are living words. Eternal words. Mark 7. Oh, it not be... Anything much more thrilling to you than say, I read your Bible and have the Lord talk to you. Well, I mean, it's thrilling to see something there. Mark chapter 7, verse 16. Jesus speaking, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive? So that's what he means when he says having ears to hear is to understand what he's talking about. And uh, that's what was not going on with some of the people in the early church. So the Lord said, He that hath ears to hear. But listen, you better pay attention. Yeah. Open your ears, yeah. 
Listen to what I got to say. You know. People, the phrase today is, you see what I'm saying? Which is a dumb statement. No, I didn't see what you were saying. I didn't see the words, but I understand what you were saying. But that's what it means. Do you have ears to hear? You understand what I'm talking about? And the same thing the Lord is saying here. Now notice he said in verse 7, He that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. By the way, just in passing, the tree of life is mentioned six times in the Bible. It never has anything to do with anybody's salvation. And it doesn't here either. But uh, the thing I want to zero in on, he says, uh, To him that overcometh, well, look back at 1 John, chapter 4. That's that old uh, Protestant prayer, the Lord help us to hold out to the end. In other words, help us to overcome and be able to go to heaven. Uh, if you're saved, you're going to hold out to the end. And you're going to get to heaven. You might not uh, get there the way you want to. You might be backslidden on the Lord when you get there, but you're going to get there. But what about this overcoming? fact is we have, if you're saved, you have overcome. Chapter 5, chapter 4 rather, verse 4, ye are of God, little children, and have, past tense, <coughs> overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Them is the false prophets he's talking about in verses 1 through 3 there. Look across the page at chapter 5, 1 John 5, verse 4. <coughs> For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Question. What is born of God? Save people. Born again, right? Born of the Spirit. Born of the Word. Born of God. What did he just say? If you're born of God, you've already overcome the world. Didn't you say that? Galatians 1, the Lord said he, he came to, to uh, give us victory over the world, over this present evil world. And so, uh, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, which has already been exercised in the Lord, which is what saved you, or uh, you might lose it along the way and forget you're a Christian or something like that and totally backslide on God. But it's already in the past. It's already taken place. You've already overcome. Verse, uh, um, this is he that came by water and blood. Telling the, how you overcame and so forth. That's in verse, verse 6. Verse, uh, verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That's the faith in verse 4. How did you overcome the world? Even our faith. So, you, when he says uh, in Revelation, get back over there to the verse, when he says in verse 7, he that hath an ear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I do such and such. He says it all the way through these churches. You've already overcome. So the only person that that, uh, that wouldn't apply to in what he's saying there is a lost person. You have overcome. And yet people will use that verse and others in these Seven churches to him that overcometh, I'll do this and that, to, to uh, tie to his salvation. Not about salvation. Okay. Any comments on this first church of Ephesus? The apostolic period is about 100 AD. Yes, sir. The way that faith comes by hearing me by the word of God, yeah. and then why we're supposed to go out and tell people the word of God so they'll get some faith and they'll get saved by God's word. Yeah. He's not listening to that too close, but I not quite understand it. But really, we should never be discouraged if somebody doesn't get saved because our job is to get the Word of God. And you know, have done, that's all we can do. Yeah. Uh, people do get discouraged, and you should have a, a heart to want to pray for that person and so on and so forth. But if they don't get saved, it's not your fault if you gave them a clear cut gospel. Okay, if you did what you're supposed to do, it's not your fault. If they don't get saved, it's their own fault. They turn from the truth, or they don't have an ear to hear, or whatever the case. You plant a seed, and the Bible says one plants, one waters, and so on. But God giveth the increase. If there's any increase, God gave it. Just like you put a garden in your backyard, you plant that seed, and you water it. And what if it doesn't come up? What do you do? What you're supposed to do? What you could? If it does come up, why did it come up? God gave the increase. Can't get credit for getting saved. Can't get credit for them not getting saved. We have nothing. No, to do. that's right. We're we're mailmen. That's what I'm saying. That helps you not be discouraged as much. You you got witness to somebody whether they get saved or not. You've done as much as you can do. I've heard people say they're never going to witness again because nobody cares. Well, who knows? That next one you talk to might be one who does care. It just never. Yeah. Yes. 
How does the Catholic Church get around the call no man father thing? How they get around it? Yeah, how do they, because they just do well, it Matthew like... 23, they don't apply that to themselves. They apply it to those Pharisees back there, but they're just as Pharisaical as anybody else. They just don't make applications to themselves with it. There's a lot of things in the Bible, thou shalt, thou shalt not, but people don't make application to it like they should. Yes, sir. My mother-in-law, she's been reading, she was reading the Bible, she saw that, she asked that preacher, the Catholic priest, something that was said, you're not supposed to call anybody father like that. God said, she said that he explained it away some way. They try to explain it away. Oh, they do explain it away. Council of Trent, 1547, uh, they, the, the uh, council decreed that church tradition is equal with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So if the Pope says such and such, it has just as much validity as if you read it in the Bible. And if he says something that appears to be contradictory, he's not really contradicting, you just don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so he becomes the final authority in the church. That's a bad thing, that council. Yeah, it is a bad thing. thing. This ought to be your final authority. In your Christian life. Hey. All right, any other comments about that? We're going to get more on Catholicism later on. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to add to this. Um, I was raised Catholic, and in our Sunday school class, we were taught that the Pope was infallible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anything that the Pope says, they take as being said by God, practically. So. Yeah. There are some uh, regulations on that. He has to be seated on the throne to make the decree, which is in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And it is a throne. And by the way, there's four columns around that throne. And the top of each column is the sun god in, in, uh, on that column. Uh, sun god appears as a triangle. All seeing eye, you thought was in Hinduism, it's in Catholicism. In fact, I got a picture. My wife and I took it. We went to Catholic church when we was in Germany. And right at the top of the ceiling was that all seeing eye. I took a picture of it. Um, he has to speak ex cathedra, that is out of the throne. And uh, when he does, whatever he decrees is binding on the whole church. It is an infallible decree. The assumption of Mary going to heaven uh, bodily uh, was decreed by the Pope back in the 1800s. The Immaculate Conception was decreed back in the 1800s that she was born sinless. Well, where are you going to stop that? If she was born sinless, was her mama also? Uh, all those things uh, are binding on the church and of equal authority with the scriptures in, in a technical sense, but in reality, it's above the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Above the scriptures. So if he says something contrary to the book, then you know, somebody didn't translate it right or somebody doesn't understand it or whatever the case might be. Any other comments on that? We're going to see more about Catholicism when we get to the entire. Okay, verse 8. Got, uh, in fact, let's not start. Say we've got one minute left. We'll get into the next church, which is Smyrna. And you might want to read that passage between now and next week and learn some things about Smyrna. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Well, you were talking earlier about being, you know, politically correct and tolerant and intolerant. Uh, yeah. They tell you you got to have an open mind. You know, people will say to you. And I, I read. I equate that with having open borders. Anything gets in and give you goes to destruction. The only open mind you ought to have is be open to God. Check things out by what he says. Is it good? Yes, sir. It is not using the Bible at all. The Bible says that there's none that's good. good. No, not one. All of it comes to the glory of God. Yeah. What is that? that all means, that means, that's God speaking. That means everybody but him. Sure. And besides, those folks, they go on retirement. I'm glad my Lord doesn't decide. They, uh, they believe because they're in the Catholic Church, that's part of them going to get them to have those seven sacraments they've got to be involved in. But uh, you can witness to somebody sometime and you say, you say that, and the response will be, I'm a Catholic. I'm Catholic. Okay. So what? What is that going to supposed to do for you? But that's ingrained in their mind that it should be. In fact, the marquee on the Catholic Church out on Highway down here, between here and the bar, that says uh, they got on the marquee, it's time to return to the Mother Church. This is what they call it, the Catholic Church. Yes, sir. They wouldn't let my cousins, I had a couple of cousins, they were all Catholic, they wouldn't let them read, they wouldn't let them read a book unless they got permission. Well, until about uh, maybe 30 years ago, 
Uh, individual Catholics were not supposed to read the Bible. It was up to the priest to explain everything. But then, um, due to the conflicts in America, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in America, due to the conflicts in the mass of Bibles being produced and all that stuff, that was lifted so that they could have their own Bible. Also, the priest only preached in Latin for the first few hundred years, and some of that has changed as well. They, they lightened up on some of that stuff. It was not helping anybody. It did help Martin Luther. He was a monk, Catholic monk. He got saved by reading Romans. It said, that what jumped off the page of him, that just shall live by faith. And he compared that to all everything that we're supposed to be doing as Catholics. He said, That's, you know, there's no faith in that. Okay, any other comments? All right, you go downtown Saturday and straight and preach that, okay? <laughs> We were out running around doing some witnessing and stuff one time, me and three old guys back in Stone Age. And we drove by St. Mary's old church down there, and there was a, there was a grove out beside it. The Bible talks about the groves. The grove is a, a group of trees, a clump of a little forest where there's an idol set up, and they worship usually under an oak tree. There's a grove down there with a life size statue of Mary in it, and we came driving by, and my friend said, Stop the car, stop the car. He got out and went over, and Mary's doing this not really young. He stuck some tracks <laughs> in her hand. <laughs> he says maybe one of the nuns will get that and get saved. Any other comments? Yes, sir. I may or may not have been with a friend when we drove by a Catholic church in Childersburg, Alabama, and there was just too many statues to refuse. I mean, we started laying them down where they're like little prayer benches and stuff. We had to. <laughs> Hopefully they see the word. Should come to the forefront. I believe the Pope is going to be the second beast, the religious right arm, right hand man of the Antichrist. We'll see that in chapter uh, 13. But uh, I don't know. Islam is really moving up. Could be. Well, the Antichrist has to have uh, everything at level off. That's why he's in favor of integration. He wants a great race. That's why he's in favor of mongrelizing society, uh, religiously, politically, and everything else. Uh, it's the only way to rule everybody. But we've got to keep in mind, he's not going to rule the world. That's what a lot of people say. But he's going to rule the Western world. Okay, the kings of the East are going to be opposed to him, the kings of the North, and so on and so forth. And so uh, Islam is not, is not part of the West, really. It's, it's infiltrated. It's all already taken over the British Isles, but um, I don't know what, what point they'll play in. Okay, somebody figure that out. Let's, let's be dismissed in prayer. Brother Martin, dismiss us, please say. Boy, we just want to thank you for this time coming in here and learning about your Lord and just learning what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to follow you, Lord.